help you with that situation. Good to see everyone. I wore my Hawaiian shirt, maybe the last hua, you know, until it gets really cold. So uh, it's been nice, hasn't it? The Lord has blessed us, truly. And for those of you who are watching online outside of, this is the time to come visit Virginia. This is the season right now. The f- leaves are ch- changing. We invite you to come out and visit us if you're watching outside of Virginia. Don't come in August. Whew, man, it's bad. Come in, come in the fall. Come in the springtime. Let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 6 tonight as we are continuing our study through the Old Testament. We find ourselves in the sixth chapter of Nehemiah where Nehemiah is uh, doing the work, doing the good work. Let's pray and ask God to bless our time in his word. And Father, we thank you so much, God, for gathering us here today. And we do ask that you uh, would speak to us tonight in this chapter, Lord. Um, we, we've gathered together, Lord, uh, to hear from you. And uh, so, Father, help us to focus in the next few minutes on your word, Lord, going beyond my notes, Father. Speak to us individually and congregationally, but we ask it in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. The importance of the wall. We've been studying, we're again in chapter six, and we got to be reminded of what was the importance of the wall back then. And of course, it was to protect God's people. He, God designed it, God designed Jerusalem, God laid it out, God gave the land to Israel, and He designed it in a sense. This is what I want. This is how I want it. I want the people to feel protected. I want the people to know that they can live within this wall and feel protected and know that I am with them, know that uh, I am blessing them. And really, uh, and it served uh, as a sign for Israel's enemies. Don't, don't come in. Don't try to mess with my people. But we know the history and we've been studying it throughout the Old Testament. And, and Nehemiah was the man who got the call to go and rebuild the walls that were broken down after the deportation of Israel to Babylon. And under King uh, Artaxerxes, uh, the Persian king at this point, he was given the okay. But not only was the wall important, his call was important. Nehemiah's call was important. Serving God and not man. But blessing man while serving God. That's the attitude we must take. If we have the call and it comes at differing times and differing seasons, it's just the call. You know that you'll have it. It's just something that you know that God has called you, but it, it requires or demands a response. When the call comes, it demands a response. Now, it can be a, a response of disobedience or obedience. And an obedient response, hopefully that's the response, well, it demands commitment. And commitment, as we've been reading through this chapter, man, is all over it. Uh, Are you ready for the call? Are you ready for the work? Are you ready to do God's will? Because Nehemiah uh, has already had to deal with intimidation, oppression, division, Discouragement, that's the recruiting poster. Not many mighty, not many noble, but come on and get involved with God's work. Yes, there'll be oppression. Yes, there'll be division. Yes, there'll be discouragement, which all leads to this chapter, really, if we wanted to look and label it a distraction. There'll always be distraction in ministry. So I've quoted before, if Satan can't destroy you, he will what? He will distract you. And I love that quote, and it's so true. You know, if he can keep us in the the walls of the church, and church is important, we'll see that as we continue through Hebrews. But if he can just keep us in these walls, he's happy with that. Don't go out. Don't go spread the word. Don't go spread the gospel. Don't go help other people. Don't visit those in the hospital. Don't feed the poor. Don't clothe the the naked, the homeless. If you can just keep us in here enjoying this, then 
He, he's fine with that. That couldn't be clearer than in our chapter tonight, speaking on distraction. It also shows discernment and wisdom on Nehemiah's part, where God is with him. God is with him. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. Now what happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates, just like a, a construction worker. You know, I, I, I grow up, I, I, grow, I grow up, I grew up in Orange County in California where the weather is wonderful and, and a, a lot of uh, uh, family, uh, if I can say, were in the construction business. Everything from uh, stick house building to cement to everything, uh, garden, you know, gardeners and everything. And, uh, and then we go and visit their home and it's still a work in progress, man. You know, yeah, we're going to get that wall, honey. And there's the poor wife, you know. She, she goes and visits opening houses where the house is built and beautiful. And yet their own wall hasn't been built yet. It still needs drywall. We still need to do this. We, you know, it cracks me up. We'll see that next week, Lord willing, if we're in chapter 7. Uh, but the walls hung the doors and the gates. And that Sambalat and Geshem sent to me saying, come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono, but they thought to do me harm. Guys, we must guard, uh, we must guard opportunities for the enemy to enter into our weak points. We must guard those opportunities. In this case, the open sections of the wall where the doors are to be hung, and he knew it, he knew the doors still need to be hung, but the wall is, is completed as far as as far as the, the, you know, the, the wall itself and the bricks and so on and so forth. But we need to be especially alert and not give the enemy a foothold, especially in areas of weakness. And we all have those weaknesses. We all have them. You know them. Let's be honest. We all have them. And we need to be very careful that the enemy doesn't get a foothold. We need to be especially on the alert and not give him a foothold. And he comes at us in different ways and in different times. And, you know, and I'm, I'm no different. You know, uh, we're battling, you know, battling. The enemy is crafty, cunning, clever. He won't give up. It's keeping, the, keeping the progress of the wall from being completed. He won't give up. He sees the doors that aren't hung. He'll continue to harass. He won't give up. As we have learned Behind those openings were Jews armed with swords. Nehemiah was smart. And not only that, the people who were working on the wall had a sword and a trowel. But behind them, remember, he set men and women with, with implements, mainly probably men, with, uh, with weapons to encourage the people as they, as they are doing the work. And the people and the work was guarded. But these knuckleheads, Sam Ballard, Geshem, and uh, this other guy here, they, uh, they already showed their intent toward Nehemiah. They, they showed their intent to stop the building. And why? In order to control the lives of the Jews with intimidation and fear, which they had been doing prior to Nehemiah coming. And that's why Nehemiah was broken when he heard that the walls were still not rebuilt. They were in a disarray. They were crumbled. They, and, and that's what broke his heart because he knew this was not God's way. This is not what God wanted. And so these enemies, he said, say, hey, come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. Now, Ono was halfway point on the border between Jerusalem and Samaria. It was halfway, it was about 30 miles north of Jerusalem. And it was there that they wanted to meet. Now, what's interesting is when you look up the word Ono, it's appropriately, appropriately named grief or strength. <laughs> so his, his, one or the other is going to happen. You know, there's going to be grief, you're halfway there, wherever you're going. Or there's, there's going to give you strength to say, hey, we're almost there. 
But in this case, they, as he says, they thought to do me harm. Wisdom tells us if they tried to do you harm before, they will try and harm you, what, again. Right? They will try to harm you again. And this meeting is nothing more than an assassination plot against Nehemiah. And he knows that. And he's got wisdom in that. And he's not going to fall to this fake meeting, this harmful meeting that they want to have with him. Um, he knows that as, and if he goes there, then who knows what's, who's waiting for him to attack him, you see? Who knows who's, who's there to assassinate him? He, he's no dummy, but they thought to do me harm. First Peter 5, 8 says something interesting. He wrote, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And it is written that when lions get old, they lose teeth. They are no longer able to hunt and attack, so they become the guards of the pride. You guys know this. Their entire purpose is to roar and scare, right? Any approaching prey towards the younger lion so they can attack them. So that's why they sit out there. And if a prey comes by, they'll roar and they'll shoot the prey to a different direction where the, the younger pride, the pride of the younger lions are, and so they can attack them. And then old grumpy grandpa comes in there and everybody walks away so he can have the first filet mignon or whatever it is. And this is what the enemy loves to do with us. He loves to take us away from the project. He likes to get us away from the work, from the Lord's work. Tries to call us out to, oh no, when we should say, oh no. Yoko, oh no. But anyway, but the good news is that the Bible says the devil is a defeated foe. He may roar and try to scare us. He may roar, but all he can do is roar. Because our line of the tribe of Judah is greater, amen? He's greater than. And so he says in verse 3, so I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work. I like that. So that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times and I answered them in the same manner. Nehemiah has been commissioned by God to build a wall, not to attend meetings. To build a wall, not to attend conferences or not to, you know, uh, get off the wall. Not to, uh, uh, you know, walk away from what he has been called to do. Not to get involved in irrelevant discussions. And this is another tactic of the enemy, as I said. He knows his God-given calling, and he wants to remain focused on that. There are many distractions that the enemy brings to us, and this is one that he has discerned and knows this is not good. I know these guys. They've already shown, you know, their cards, and I know what they're up to. You see, it wasn't just rebuilding a wall. It was God's wall. It was God's work. And I love it because he calls it a, a great work. It's a great work. Ministry is a great work. Serving other people, being others' minds is a great heart to have. It's great. Nehemiah has been through it, doesn't he? It's not what he asked for, but it's what his God, his God uh, has, is doing through his heart and what he has called him to, to do in serving. So like any servant of God, he put his hand to the plow and he's not going to look back. He's not going to be distracted nor leave the good work at hand. Why would he? He will not do that. Taking him, if he did leave, then that would also distract the people who are completing the wall, distract the folks. They're already a little you know, jittery. We've studied that already. And anything to take the, the pastor away, anything to take away the leader, anything to take away the one who has been given them the vision and the direction and the encouragement. Uh, no, uh, he, he doesn't need to be going and attending meetings. He has been commissioned to build the wall. And when we are doing the work of God, as I said, the enemy will always bring his attacks, listen, at the start, and some of you are at the start, in the middle, and some of you are in the middle, 
and also in the end, in order to start over again in another work. We must be focused on what we have been called to do for the Lord and continue on. That's just simple wisdom right there. We have to know that until God is done with us, the enemy will try and keep us from the work God has called us to complete. And as I've said before, we are eternal. We are eternal until our work is done on earth, until he calls us home. So think that way. We are eternal until the Lord calls me home. But notice that the enemy is persistent. They continue to send these messages. He says here four times, and man, I just answered them in the same manner. That's a good leader. Why would I change my mind? I'm not going. I am at the good work. Why are you continually sending these messages? (laughs) He's relentless, the enemy is, isn't he? But what he's trying to do here is wear him down. Double think or rethink this or or question himself and question his call and question the work. No, he's not going to allow that to to get to him. He's not going to allow it to wear him down. He must be strong. And we must be strong, guys. And even if we trip and fall, and we will, we'll trip and fall. As I always say, you got to get up and do the work that was, you've been called to do and give the enemy a defeat in your victory in that. He doesn't like you when you get back up. He doesn't like you when you dust yourself off. He doesn't like you when you get on your knees and repent. He doesn't like it when you get back on your feet and go on with the work that you've been called to do. He don't like that at all. When Jesus was doing the greatest work, the greatest work on the cross, just think about that. He had to endure the enemy through the voices of man saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. He saved others Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe. It's the enemies behind their voices. It's Satan. Satan did not want Jesus to be there on that cross because he knew he was paying the penalty of our sin. Early in Jesus' ministry, he wanted Jesus to bow down to him. He wanted Jesus to worship him. Of course, we know the Lord did not. And even there on the cross, it's come down, come down. As these guys are saying, come down to Ono. Come, let's have a meeting. Come away from the wall. You can come away from the wall for a week. You can come away from the wall for three days. Come away from the wall. Charles Spurgeon said, learn to say no. It'll be more, it'll be of more use to you than to be able to read Latin, to be able to read Greek, to be able to read Hebrew. Say no. Everyone say no. No. There you go. See? Just look yourself in the mirror and say no. No. We all got to learn to say that, don't we? Even in our weakest point. No. (laughs) We need to say that. Verse 5 going on. He says, Then Sambalat sent his servant to me as before. The fifth time. He, He, I'll tell you, with an open letter in his hand and it is written this is an open letter okay and it is reported among the nations and Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel therefore according to these rumors you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king and you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem saying there is a king in Judah Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come therefore and let us um, consult together. Then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say are being done. But you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid. Saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Today, we seldom receive letters. I recently received a letter, and normally they're from jail or prison. And uh, 
Um, so that's the only time that we'll normally receive uh, letters, uh, written letters, and I, re- I write back. Uh, those who, who write, they need encouragement, they you know, uh, uh, need prayer. S- some of the inmates I know, <laughs> others I don't know. But uh, normally f- today folks send emails. And yesterday I received an email of encouragement and blessing you know, for, for what we're doing here at, at Calvary Chapel, man. It was just an encouraging word. Just, just what, you know, I love those emails or texts or even letters that come just at the right time. You know, you just need to be encouraged. You just, it was awesome. And then today I received an email of what we are doing wrong here at Calvary Chapel. So yesterday's e- uh, email was what we're doing great. And today's email was what we were doing wrong. One was declaring good things. The other was demanding good things. And so, you, you know, it, it, that's life. That's, that's what happens. You know, these letters will come. Uh, back in the day when we did write letters and somebody wanted to write a letter of, and put me down and put the church down and never signed it, what's, what's the rule? Throw it away. Don't respond. Burn it. Yeah. Don't even look down first. Look down. Did they, okay. But you know how we are. Well, I wonder what they did say, though. Let me... No, Chuck said just burn it, but... But today, emails, tell on yourself. We tell on ourselves who it is that was sent. This is a message of intimidation and lies, though. This is a mes- message to tear him down. You know what a letter can do. You know what a bad email can do. It can ruin your day. It can, it can, it can ruin... You know what a message somebody can come up to you while you're in the midst of doing a work for the Lord, and it can really mess you up, can't it? It really can. And that's what's happening here. The motivation behind broadcasting this uh, grievance is, is for division and dissension. He knows that. Hear ye, hear ye. It is reported among the nations and so on. Oh, you just want to be the king. You, you know, you're just building the wall so you can have your own kingdom. His enemies are trying to make others question the motivation behind Nehemiah's leadership. That's all he's trying to do. He wants to take over. He wants to be this dictator. It's just a bunch of lies. Again, the enemy also tried this with Jesus. When the religious Jews accused Jesus of wanting to be king, replacing Caesar. Uh, I'd like to remind the people then that Jesus has always been the king. The king of kings. And as the king of kings, the king of kings never replaces nor is in competition or has any equals, period. But here they're lying and they're broadcasting it and they want people to, to hear it. And he said, then I sent him saying, no such thing as you say or as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. And their heart was evil. For they all were trying to make us afraid. Their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Oh, the words, the words, the words. We've talked about that before. How one little letter, how one little note, how one little spoken word can just mess you up. The wall will not be completed. Their hands will be weakened. But notice how he truly responds. He takes it to the Lord. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Let my hands not be used for fisticuffs. Let, let my tongue not be used for lashing. Let, let, let my heart not get as dark as theirs, God. He says, oh God, strengthen my hands. Nehemiah is going to let God defend him. And we must remember, he is our defense. He prayed for strength to get through and finish the good work. We're so close. We're so close. You know, I want to do well. I want to finish well for you, God. Not for me, for you. Oh, God, strengthen my hands. And then in verse 10, he goes on. And afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, <laughs> who was a secret informer. And actually, that word there, 
secret informer means is translated as he was detained or he was a, a sh- a shut up in his house. He was detained in his home. Although he is, he'll find out, he was a rascal. Um, and he said, notice, let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you indeed at night. They will come to kill you. You didn't heed the messages. You, you, you didn't go to their meeting. You didn't attend their conven- convention of, you know, of assassination. And now they're going to come. They're, gonna, they're coming after you, man. You know, and, uh, why this guy was shut up in his house, um, we don't know. Why uh, Nehemiah is even uh, going to his home and, and, and perhaps uh, Shemaiah bef- had befriended Nehemiah and, and maybe me- Nehemiah went to check in on him because he's a shut-in at this point. But it seems the reason for him being a shut-in was to set up Nehemiah. When Nehemiah heard the word and out of the kindness of his heart, out of the servanthood of his heart, He heard that a brother was shut up, shut in. And as we know the story already, he was just setting Nehemiah up. And notice that he uses God's house and the ministry to fool this man. He he uses God. He uses the temple, the temple of God, the, the temple there, as we've been speaking of on Sundays, where God will meet the high priest, will God's presence, the Shekinah glory, will come yearly. There where God has instructed the Jews to go and worship him, the house of worship, come, let us meet together in the house of God, the house of worship, within the temple. Are they allowed to go into the temple? Survey says, no. no. But see what could happen if Nehemiah wasn't walking strong with God, knew his calling, knew the work was good, knew that, he, that, that the guys were trying to fool him and get him to a place where he doesn't belong. No, you're not allowed to go into the, who's allowed to go into the temple? The priest, yeah. And a man of God doesn't need to hide and this is what he's trying to get him to do. And verse 11 said, should such a man as I flee, I love this guy. And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. He said before, I cannot come down. And now he declared, I will not go in. What are you trying to do to me? I've come here with a good intent. I've come here to minister to you. I've come here to see how you're doing. And, and you're trying to take me in, in disregard of God's word, disregard of, of the holiness of God. And you're trying to take me in. And again, and notice, well, look at verse 12. Then I perceived, praise God for the gift of discernment. Praise God that he gives us discernment. And that he perceived that God had not sent him. And the NLT says God had not spoken to him at all. But that he pronounced this false prophecy, this prophecy against me. Because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Shemaiah appeared to be very religious. But he was nothing but a hireling. He was nothing but a false prophet. Great men and women of God are men and women of the word. And Nehemiah was one of those men. He was a man of the word. And it was against God's law for someone, as we said, to go into the temple. And he knew that. God will never transgress his word. And if God has called us to build a wall, then that's what he wants us to be about. Building the wall. Unless God himself personally comes and changes that plan. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, God has spoken to me a word. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And God has told me that you need to marry me. You know, that's for singles. Beware. Oh, really? Yeah, God told me you need to marry me. Oh, okay. Well, God has my phone number. And when he calls me, 
Shazam. <laughs> but that's, that's true. When people come up to me and give me a prophetic word, you know, say, okay, well, thank you, God bless you. We'll, we'll see if it comes to pass. You know, thank you for that. I, I, hey, you never know, right? I just receive it. And I remember, of course, it was at uh, 8.55 in the morning. Someone came and gave me a letter and wanted me to read it and said God spoke to this person and that God wanted this person to come over the pulpit and read it. <laughs> I said, you got the wrong church <laughs> and the wrong pulpit. Have a nice day. And just escorted that person out. God will never transgress his word. And this joker, as it is revealed, was on the enemy's payroll. How sad, huh? Jesus had his Judas, and Nehemiah has his Shemaiah. Verse 13, for this reason, and he just lays it out, he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way, and what? And sin. Now remember, Nehemiah's writing this out as if he's writing a diary, as he's writing out his memoir. And he's writing it out for us to read, no doubt, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But he's telling us that he wants to put fear in me, and he wants me to sin, to act that way and sin. He says, so that they might have cause for an evil report, that they might reproach me. I could just see the headlines of the Jerusalem Post back then. You know, Nehemiah goes into the temple. Nehemiah should have leprosy. Nehemiah did what, uh, what, what, what an Old Testament dude did. can't remember his name. Uz, uh, Uzziah did. And, uh, and just slam him and just ridicule him. And he could have done that out of fear. Let's go. They're coming. Let's go. Don't fall down when you do it, though. But, uh, but he didn't. He didn't. Satan loves to tempt us. Listen, somebody here with isolation. He loves to tempt us with isolation and fear. Well, I'll just, I'll just isolate. I just won't come back to church. I'll just not do the work. I, just, I won't even call the ministry leader. I won't even tell him I can't make it. I'm just going to isolate. You know, and that sits in, and isolation and fear sits in it. And, and there's so many applications and so many illustrations of the Bible of this. And then, you know, with that, you've taken out you're taken out of the team, out of the body. And he loves that too, the enemy does. Because you're no longer exercising your gifts. You're no longer, you know, in the will of God in a sense to what he has called you to do here or at a local church or in the ministry. And he loves to ruin our integrity among the people. Verse 14, my God, again, I love how he <laughs> deals with this. My God, he says, Remember Tobiah and Sam Ballot. There's no saying, you can talk about me all that you please. I'll talk about you when I'm on my knees. You ever got to hear that? There used to be a song. We used to sing that song. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed. You know, you talk about me, I'll talk about you when I'm on my knees. This is what he's doing here. He said, my God, remember Tobiah and Sam Ballot. According to these, their works... And the prophetess, no, no idea, I don't even know who that is, but apparently she's messing with him. And the rest of the prophets, who would have made me afraid, I love that. Because he's like you and me, who would have made me afraid. Lord, I know my limits, I know, I'm just flesh, like you, God. Or like, like others, excuse me. I'm flesh, God, like other men and women. And they would have made me afraid. But I hold on to you, Lord. And I hold on to what I've been called to do. And I'm not going to look to the left or to the right. I'm not going to allow a, a, a broadcast message to intimidate me. I'm not going to allow, allow these, these men who, who work for the king intimidate me. Because, because, well, God, I serve you. You're greater than all. Nehemiah knows his enemy, and he once again chooses the weapon of prayer and uses it to turn them over to God. Proverbs 29, 25 says this, the fear of man brings a snare, 
or the NI, I think the, NI, the NIV, NI, NLT says, fearing people is a dangerous trap. Fearing people is a dangerous trap. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. You fear people? People can be scary. People can be feared. You don't need to fear people. You fear God. You love God. Let God take care of those who are trying to make us afraid and trying to intimidate us. You take care, God, you take care of those. You know people's hearts. There's any false reports and false prophecies coming. God, you take care of it. You know it is. Lord, we're going to turn it over to you. Well, in verse 15, notice it says, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elu, which is September, in 52 days. September 25th. Uh, that's a good date for us. We were married on September 25th. I was up there and my cousin married us. Uh, he was ordained. It wasn't the backyard and it wasn't my cousin, but he was ordained. It was a good wedding. But uh, he said, say this, with this ring, I do wed. And I said, with this wing, I do red. I was so nervous. But you don't care about that. Back to to the 25th day of Elu. Nehemiah left Persia by permission of the king to build the wall in Jerusalem on March 14th, 445 BC, taking several months to journey and getting to Jerusalem and finishing the wall in just 52 days on September 25th. The people under Nehemiah's leadership finished the good work because they put their hearts to it. They put their minds to it. Were they weak? Yes. Did they have their their issues? Yes. Did they have infighting? Yes. Did some of their own people try to overtax them and and, uh, bring in a famine? Yes. There was all of this. And that's just, ministry is messy. You know, what's the scripture say? If the stalls aren't dirty, then there's no work. You know, so the stalls have to be dirty. And we're in the people business, guys. And people are people. People. You know, and they're people. They're, they're you and me. We're messy. We can be messy. But, praise God. He says here that the people, or they have finished the wall. The people under Nehemiah's leadership finished the good work. Because they put their hearts and minds and their shoulders into the work. We're all in. We're all in, Pastor Pastor Nehemiah, we're all in, man. You've come, given us vision, given us direction. We're all in. And this they did, guys. Don't forget, fulfilling Daniel, Daniel 25. For Daniel 25b uh, said that streets shall be built again and the wall even in what? Troublesome times. <laughs> we're not done yet, okay? There are some troublesome times going on when this wall was being built. The battles were hard, the, great, the work was great, the challenges were constant, both from within and without. But the wall was finished and the victory is sweet. And Nehemiah knows that the battle is not over. Continue on. Look at verse 16. And it happened, and it always does, doesn't it? Guys, as I said, it's going to happen in the beginning. It's going to happen in the middle. It's going to happen in the end uh, as the last brick on the wall goes up. And then it happened. When all our enemies heard of it and all the nation around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was done by God. We did everything we could to stop the work. We did everything we could to put fear and intimidation and distraction and oppression against these people. But the wall was built. And they perceived that this work was done by God, you think? And Nehemiah must now protect what was accomplished. Look at this R.A. Torrey quote. The reason why many fail in the battle is because they wait until the hour of the battle. The reason why others succeed is because they have gained their victory on their knees long before the battle came. And we've got to continue on our knees. And they have to continue on their knees. 
There's no time to, to uh, you know, get off our knees and, and, and you know, and sit and, and just enjoy the wall. Look how nice that wall is. No, there's more work to be done because Satan doesn't rest. We said he's like a, a roaring lion. He has no teeth, but he's there to f- put fear and in, 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 intimidate us. And he hates it when God gets all the glory and honor. He hates that because he is to give, be given all the glory and honor. Verse 17, also in those days, the nobles of Judah, remember them from last week, those who were ripping their own people off, those who were taxing people, buying their property, taking their sons and daughters, marrying them off, using them as slaves, going against the word of God. Well, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and letters of Tobiah came to them. Guys, they were corresponding with the enemy. You don't need to be corresponding with the enemy. You don't need to be meeting with the enemy. You don't need to be engaging with the enemy. You don't need to be doing any of that. He says, for in many, verse 18, in Judah were pledged to him. They swore to him. They swore allegiance. They swore allegiance to their own enemy. Ah, here's why. Because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara. And his son, Jehoanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berakiah. Ber- Guys, that Meshulam, the son of Berakiah, had helped to build the wall. Look at chapter 3, verse 4. You can write it down. And verse 30. They were right there in the work. And all the time they were corresponding with the enemy. They had swore allegiance to the, to the enemy. Oh, what, what a work will bring out. What a great work will bring out in people. You really get to know people in a great work, amen? These guys literally got in bed with the enemy. They married. They intermarried. They were unequally yoked with a Gentile heathen. And not only that, the enemy of God's people. And Tobiah had connections with important Jews through this marriage and and many in Judah instead of rebuking and denouncing this ungodly pairing they were pledged to him Kidner a, a commentator said trading contracts facilitated by marriage connections it's all for the almighty dollar it's all for the money They had compromised by marrying the enemy rather than trying to defeat him. They were walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Corresponding with the enemy. Corresponding with the ungodly. Verse 19, also they reported his good deeds before me. I I can just see that. No, 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 Nehemiah. Tobiah, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's done good things. And he says, and reported my words to him. <laughs> He's not a good guy. You're, you're a fool. All of you are fools for corresponding with this guy, for thinking that he's a good guy. Tobias sent letters to frighten me, he says. I'll close with this, Proverbs 28, 4. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law, contend with them. Don't give up, guys. You have Christ. You have Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the church. You have brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't give up. Continue to contend with the enemy. Like I said, if you, if you strip, if you fall, get up. We need you. We need you in the fight. Amen. Father, thank you, God, for this time in your word, and thank you, Lord, for speaking to us and encouraging us, God. Lord Jesus, we need you so much. The world that we're living, God, so many lies being thrown out there, Lord, so many lies for, Lord, our our children who are believing it, our friends who are living it, Lord. That's the enemy. He's just a liar. And help us, God, not to get caught up Help us to stay focused, Lord God. 
on the main thing, and that's you, Jesus, and what you've done on the cross, and how you resurrected from the grave, and you overcome death and decay, and you saved us, and you've cleansed us and washed us, and we can call you Abba. We can call you Savior, and you call us children, and we're thankful for that, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name.